Everyone asks me what a perineal specialist midwife actually is. So just to give you an idea of my day, I see women who've had a severe tear. Now, I quite often will refer to OAC, severe tear, third and fourth degree tear. I swap around. Basically, they're all severe tears, but women don't have a clue what we're talking about when we say OAC or third and fourth degree tear. So OAC stands for obstetric anal sphincter injury. But in my day, I see women and follow them up who've either had a severe tear or they've had a complication or a breakdown. I do a lot of teaching around pelvic health, so ways to reduce the chance um, of having a severe tear, but also suturing. And as Sue said, I lead on the OAC Care Bundle and I work down in Plymouth. But first and foremost, I am a midwife. So I'm a home birth midwife, I'm a high risk midwife. And I think that women's pelvic health is a problem we need to spotlight more. See, when I first qualified, this was the very edge of my knowledge, but it shouldn't have been. Pelvic health and midwifery are actually more intertwined than we ever historically thought. And these stories we've just heard tonight from those brave women are the tip of the iceberg, because actually one in three women suffer with urinary incontinence, one in 10 anal incontinence, prolapse, chronic pain, sexual dysfunction, they're all too common following birth. And none of that list was someone with a severe tear. Just imagine for a moment that you suffer with fecal incontinence. How would that have changed your day to day? Well, you would have known where every single toilet was, You'd have panicked when there was a queue. Would you have gone for that run you did this morning? Would you have done any exercise at all? How would that have impacted your job? You know, could I have been a midwife if I also leaked? So how would I then even financially support myself? We know that if you suffer with incontinence, you are more likely to suffer with a mental health problem. And I just named two taboos in one sentence. So is it any wonder that these women suffer in silence, that they don't share their stories, they either normalize their problems or they're just too embarrassed to even tell anyone or go to their GP and talk about it. So when we're looking at symptoms, if you have a more severe tear, you are more likely to have a problem. And actually, if you have a missed severe tear, and that would be a tear that is more severe, but we just don't pick it up at birth, you're actually most likely to suffer. And those are the stories we heard tonight, actually. The majority of people didn't have it picked up at birth. The majority of women will have a tear when they have a vaginal birth. Caesareans are not free. You know, there's risks involved with caesareans too. So about 85% of women will have some degree of tearing. They generally heal well, and it's okay. But actually, we need to recognize these complications are higher if you have a more serious tear. Now that rate has gone up. Our HES data shows that. And that's what started the OAC Care Bundle. We're seeing this threefold increased rate of severe tears. And that could be partly down to detection. And what speaks, what speaks louder to me is the NMP data. And I've put that on the screen there. And this was done in 2016-17. And this is data from the whole of the UK. And it showed this huge variation in rates between trusts. One trust or hospital might have a 1.6% rate. And then it went all the way up to 7.5 in another trust. That speaks louder to me because either one trust are better at detecting tears than another, or there is something about our midwifery, our maternity cultures that makes a difference as to whether you even have a tear in the first place. As a midwife, I'm a woman's advocate and that gets me excited because there's something that I can do to make a difference and to change. Now you are at a higher risk of having a severe tear if you have a forceps birth or it's your first vaginal birth, and you heard some of the other risk factors as well, but all risk is not equal. So if we just focus on forceps and first vaginal birth, then we've just covered the majority of births full stop. So actually we need to tell all of our women about these different ways of reducing the chance of having a severe, of not having a severe tear, I should say. Now, as a midwife, I think birth is this beautiful journey when left calm and undisturbed, we generally labor much better, really well. 
But actually, if you ask women what they think a positive birth is, they tell you it's birth with choice. So for everything else I'm going to talk about tonight, this is about providing choice. Our Devon MVP group um, designed this acronym for us, and it's really helpful to think about it this way. So for everything we're going to offer, we're going to talk about the benefits of it, the risks of it, what the alternatives are, what does their intuition tell you about it? What if we do nothing? Or I like to think, actually, can I have a bit of time to think about it? Do I, can I take a bit of time, time out right now? Because there's lots of research, isn't there, on how to reduce the chance of having a severe tear. We've got multiple different care bundles. You've got Peaches and Stomp and the Australian bundle and the Norwegian, as well as the OAC care bundle. And all of these bundles reduce the chance of you having a severe tear in the first place. And two of them improved the detection of it. And all of them reduce severe tears. At the core, these were about improving women's pelvic health. I'm going to give you the data from just one of them, which is the OAC Care Bundle. And that showed that if you gave birth in a unit that introduced the OAC Care Bundle, that women had 20% lower risk of having a severe tear without increasing the cesarean rate or the episiotomy rate. But what did the women say? And this was the data that came from OAC1, and we're doing this on a much larger scale in OAC2. But women had positive or no memories of touch whatsoever. This is the midwife was this really supportive guide who they really connected and journeyed with together. But even more so, they said they wanted more education. Antenatally wanted to know how they could reduce the chance of this happening, and postnatally, how they could care for themselves afterwards. So how do we do this? In a way that we don't scare women, but we give them the information they need so they can decide what they want in their birth plans. Now, this was an antenatal discussion guide that has been designed as part of, of OAC2. And um, it just gives an overview of kind of what's normal, what happens all the time, and what risk and recovery is. And then it gives you a whole page on reducing severe tears. And it covers antenatal perineal massage. By doing this, you will reduce the chance of having a severe tear, reduce the chance of having an episiotomy, reduce the, you know, improve the chance of having an intact perineum and actually improve the wound healing afterwards. So antenatal perineal massage, a warm compress. And this is done in the early second stage. So just when you see kind of baby's head holding a warm compress on. And again, the research shows it reduces episiotomy, it reduces the chance of having a severe tear, actually improves your chance of having an intact perineum. Improving your chances of a spontaneous vaginal birth, and that's a birth without forceps or von twos, actually automatically will decrease your risk of having an OAC. So how do we do that? We can do that by choosing where we give birth. So recommending, for example, low risk women to deliver in a low risk setting like a home birth or a midwifery led unit, avoiding intervention where possible and creating this physiological birth environment. That just means a calm environment where that woman feels safe and relaxed. So soothing lighting and smells and maybe a, a playlist that is familiar to her. Another way of improving spontaneous birth is by removing upright and active throughout labor. If you've got an epidural in second stage, the research shows lying on your side actually improves your chance of having a spontaneous vaginal birth. And also choosing a birth position that's comfortable for you. So that moment of birth, when I was a home birth midwife, or when I'm a home birth midwife, actually the majority of women land up in these positions that you can see here on all fours and kneeling and on their side. When you give birth in a hospital, there's a bed in the middle and all these preconceived ideas of how you're meant to give birth. So help women, show them the positions that are better, that come with a lower risk of having a severe tear. And that connection is really important, that trust, because those last 10, 20 seconds as you give birth make all the difference, that really slow birth, but it really feels like you want to push. So that connection with the midwife is so important to listen and do that well. The OAC Care Bundle is the same group of four practices, and they involve manual perineal protection, 
as well. So three fingers kind of curled underneath, pressed against that perineum um, and for the head as well as the shoulder. And it can be done in lots of different positions. When you have a forceps birth, when you have a complex birth, offer your hands. OK, if you're having a forceps birth, sometimes the doctor needs a second pair of hands. So be his, be the other pair of hands and put that manual protection on for her. If it's a shoulder dish, for example, the doctor might come and be your manual protection. She might do that for you. Either way, I would encourage it and follow this QR code. It shows a moving picture if you want it episiotomy and this is not about doing more episiotomies we are never going back to routine episiotomy ever again this is about improving our skills in it see 90 percent of midwives actually qualify now having never done an episiotomy and both midwives and doctors are really poor at eyeballing the angle correctly so how can we improve this and make this better well we'd encourage some simulation training so you can see in the picture there using a glove box and a pair of scissors. Um, there's some epi scissors in this one. There's some straight ones if you follow the QR code to the moving video. Just gives you an idea of how to do it. Now, why is the angle so important? Well, if you look at a perineum when you're about to give birth, it is super stretched. It's almost three times its normal width. So if you cut an episiotomy at 60 degrees, it comes down to about 0. You know, it, it, about... Um, about 40 degrees, which comes to the 0.5% chance of all sustaining a severe tear. Cut an episiotomy at 40 degrees, it comes right down close. That comes with about a 10% risk of also having a severe tear. So that small change in angle makes that big difference. I'd encourage you to have a conversation antenatally with all of your women so that they are aware. We don't want women's first hearing of this to be at a moment of birth. This QR code takes you to a study called the Red Flag Study for Episiotomy. I would encourage you to read it. It was still open access. It was only published a short while ago. But it also comes with this patient leaflet that was designed by birthing people for us to use. And this sits on Mummer Academy. It's in a couple of languages. It's a really good guide to discussing episiotomy in a non-scary way so that our birthing people know what to expect. And finally, a check after birth. And this is a really gentle check. Check this out with the women. Make sure she's happy for you to do this. You're going to look at the apex of the tear and you're going to pop a finger in that back passage. And you're feeling if there is a, a hole between the vagina and the bottom. Now, there's a very small, it's a rare chance of this happening, but it's important we check everybody, as you heard in Dimple's story earlier. And then we're going to come to that anal sanctum. Now, I'm going to ruin Haribo for life for everybody. Sorry about that. Um, if you put a Haribo on the end of your finger and roll it around, that's what an anal sphincter feels like. It's only just inside the anus. And actually, what you want to do is kind of pop a finger in and you're doing like a pill roll technique where you're starting at nine o'clock, you're around to 12 and then round to three. So you can feel a lot more than you can see. And if the bulk and the tone remain the same all the way around, then you can quite confidently say, I don't think she's got a severe tear. If it feels thinner, get somebody else to come and check it. See, anal sphincters are funny. If they tear, they kind of ping open. It's like an elastic band. And if we pick it up at that moment and repair it, that is that woman's best chance of a long-term recovery. If we miss it, something happens in that it doesn't come round again, even a few weeks later. So if she's having surgery later down the line, it won't work as well. So you miss that repair at birth. We also miss her best opportunity for repair. Couple of resources just to recommend to you. This is the RCOG Tears Hub. This is gonna be updated once the wait 2 is finished. So it will have all of the information. This is aimed at women, at families. So please do use it and the link will be at the, at the end. And we've also got the OACE Toolkit. So this is an active research study at the moment. So what I can't do is make it available online, but you are very welcome to apply for it and you will get it. We just need to log who currently has it until the end of the study. And you'll get all the QR codes and they won't be covered up. And this toolkit includes kind of discussion of how to train. It's got an antenatal discussion guide on there, but how to have those conversations with women in a short space of time. So that's all we have in our clinics, the antenatal discussion guide and much more. So just to summarize, 
the whole point of this, we want to prioritize and improve our women's pelvic health. And women want to know, they want to know about this. So we need to be empowered to empower our workforce, our future midwives, our midwives in exactly what they are telling women and they are trained at. And just so that women have the, the information that they deserve. And that's so that we got to work together, haven't we? To get this information, as Sue said, from those journals to the very people that they serve. I'm gonna leave this screen up for a second, but I do believe it's at the end as well, so we'll send it out. So please take this QR code. It will take you a page to sign up to the toolkit. Please use those resources available as well. Thank you.